This video has been a long time coming. I've hesitated to make this video because I feared that some of you would find it so flipping obvious that they wondered why I thought this would be of any interest to anyone. Does anyone really not know this stuff? Uh, or others would find it so tremendously obscure that, again, they would be quite critical of the choice of subject matter. But in this video, which is sponsored by my friends at The Great Courses Plus, more of that later, um, I'm going to talk to you about muzzle brakes. Now, I started making little plastic models of armoured fighting vehicles from World War II when I was pretty tiny. I couldn't say for certain when I made my first kit. I'm pretty sure it was an airfix kit, and I, uh, but I do remember making this kit uh, when I was eight years old. So this kit is of a Puma armoured car. Now, can you see that on the end of the barrel there, there is a thing. It's got holes in the side of it, um, so that you can see you can see all the way through it and it's a big bulge thing on the end of the barrel and I didn't know what it was. I had no idea what it was and my eight-year-old self had a level of curiosity that made me think I wonder what it is, how come some barrels have that on the end, but on the other hand um, I just sort of accepted it. I just said you know, that's the, the, the shape of the end of a barrel. But as the years went by and I made more and more kits I saw that some had these funny things on the end of the barrels, for which I had at the time no name, and others didn't. And I, I tried to spot a pattern, tried to understand what it was. So uh, is it that, uh, that small guns don't have them and big guns do? Well, uh, here's a, a very small gun. This is a 37mm anti-tank gun, which is going to come into focus eventually. There we go. Um, and you can see that it, it's got no barrel break. It's just got a, a tube with a hole in the end of it. Um, and and uh, take this yagged tiger. Uh, for instance, or, or if you don't, uh, well, it would take this one. Uh, I think I made these when I was about 10 or 11. Anyway, this is an enormous German tank destroyer, which had an enormous gun at the front. And as you can see, there's there's no barrel break. It's just, uh, if it, again, if it comes into focus, which it might if I, if I put it in front of my face. Uh, this camera, I think, uh, senses my face and and uh, focuses on faces if it can. So yeah, there you go. You see, it's just got no no, no barrel break. It's just a big, long tube. So how come some things like, for example, this Panther tank do have a barrel break on the front and others don't? It's a mystery. Well, it was a mystery to me. Um, and uh, then quite recently, I was talking to a tank commander on the Newcastle uh, Town Moor where they were doing a military demonstration. And he was a challenger tank commander. And I was talking to him and his his crew's smashing bunch of lads, and uh, I brought up the topic of muzzle brakes, and he said something very interesting. He said, what's a muzzle brake? And I thought, right, okay, I'm making this video, because if a tank commander doesn't know what a muzzle, muzzle brake is, then presumably there are, there are quite a few people out there who don't know what a muzzle brake is or what they're for, and, and then you know, they might find this video interesting, because I did eventually find out what a muzzle brake uh, was. Um, and uh, how did I do this? Well, something wonderful came along and it was called the internet. I remember I was at university, it was the first time I had access to the internet, and I thought, right, I can ask this anything. And so I thought, what, what's the sort of question I can ask the internet, which I wouldn't be able to find out uh, some other way? Uh, got it. Is that guy who's smoking loads of cigarettes in the film Brazil, is that Terry Gilliam? And I found out, yes, it is. So there you go. That was, whew, that was that, but the biggest thing that had been bothering me for, for years. And I'd finally whew, put that one to rest. Yes, the guy in the film Brazil, which is excellent, by the way, you really should see it, um, smoking all the cigarettes on the stairs. That's Terry Gilliam, the film's director. But then, shortly after that, I, this was before Google. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I can remember a time before Google. I'm that old. Um, when I was able to eventually, using the power of the internet, find out what these things are called and what they're for. It was difficult to uh, to search for something that uh, you don't know the name of, but eventually I managed it. And, and I, I sort of solved the mystery. Uh, and just, uh, just, to, just to point out some more of the depths of this mystery, think of, of uh, the Sherman tank here, for instance. This is a Sherman. It's an American tank and it has a 75mm multi-purpose gun with no barrel break. You see? No barrel break. Just a smooth tube. And uh, that fired both high explosive and armor piercing, and they had a very good uh, uh, high explosive uh, shell. So they thought, right, well, let's put a similar gun in the Churchill. So they did, and here is the British equivalent. It's a Churchill that's got a very similar gun that fired the same ammunition, and it does have a barrel break with the holes in the side. So sometimes even the same gun firing the same ammunition can can have one. Uh, but wait a minute, this doesn't go by tank either, because this is another Churchill, this one. Uh, is a Churchill with a six-pounder gun in the turret. 
Uh, they carried on, the British carried on putting six pounders in about one in five Churchills right the way to the end of the war because the uh, six pounder had an enormously superior armour piercing capability over the American 75. So it was worth having some um, uh, Churchills about the place with that uh, gun. But wait a minute, th th this is a Churchill 8 and this has a short stubby 90 millimeter howitzer in the turret. This is for firing smoke and high explosive principally and that's not a barrel break. No, it may look a bit like a barrel break. There's a bulge on the end of the barrel, but that's actually just a counterweight to counterweight the, uh, the weight of the, the breech to balance the gun out a bit. It doesn't have holes in the side. That's not a barrel break. So there you can see, I was mystified. Some guns do, some guns don't. What's it all about? Right. So what are the functions of a barrel break? A or muzzle break. Actually, muzzle break is a better, uh, more accurate term for them. So the muzzle is, is the, the, the front bit of the gun. So um, a barrel break has two main functions. One of them is to do with smoke management. You see, when you fire a gun, all that smoke, uh, in all the impurities of, of the propellant that actually shoves the shell out the front of the uh, out barrel, all that then follows the shell and goes out in front of you if you just fire down a straight tube. Uh, so you see your target, you ah, there it is, brilliant, okay, put the crosshairs on it and bang, and it disappears because it's you've just put loads of smoke in front of yourself and you can't see so well. So you're looking through the sight and checking with the binoculars and where's it gone, where's it gone? And yeah, most of the time the smoke wasn't so bad and in, in, in tanks you normally could get off a useful second shot, but sometimes it was a problem and shooting out loads of smoke in front of a gun obscures the target, whereas the barrel brake channels the smoke sideways, giving you a much clearer view ahead of you. So that's one major advantage of the uh, barrel brake, muzzle brake, keep saying barrel brake. Um, and if you've got uh, artillery that point their guns straight into the sky, uh, then you might want to uh, manage your smoke so it goes sideways, so you don't give away your position to the enemy spotters, who may be a very, very long way away, who just see well, little puffs of smoke way over there against that dark forest or something, and they can pick it out. And but, So perhaps you might give your position away if you've uh, not got a barrel break. So smoke management is one of the reasons. The other reason is recoil. You see, if you've got uh, a tube, then everything that goes that way up the tube, the shell and all the blast of the gas, um, creates an equal and opposite reaction, Newtonian physics, and you get recoil. So as you fire the gun, it goes kaboom, back into the turret of the uh, whatever the vehicle is that you're, you're in. So uh, if you've got quite a small turret, and you've got quite a powerful gun that's got a heck of a kick in it, uh, then what will happen is that the breech, if you don't have a, a, a barrel muzzle break, uh, it'll shoot backwards and smack into the back of the turret. Uh, obviously, they, before they built the turret, they worked out how long the recoil was and th then built the turret accordingly. But imagine you've got a tank of a certain, uh, certain size turret and you can't make the turret any bigger. Um, if the recoil is too great, you won't be able to fit that gun in the turret. But if you put a muzzle brake on the end, then that'll lower the recoil. The breech won't shoot backwards quite so far and maybe you can fit that gun into the turret of that uh, uh, vehicle. So that's another reason. You lower re uh, recoil and lowering recoil is good for other reasons. Um, it's good for the crew comfort, for instance. You, the, the whole vehicle doesn't sh rock back onto its... Uh, onto its um, suspension quite so violently and uh, perhaps your second shot is a little bit more accurate because you haven't shaken up the whole vehicle and, and thrown out the alignment of the sights uh, quite so much so you don't have to compensate and relay the gun. So it's good for accuracy uh, and possibly it's very slightly good for, for rate of fire, it's good for vision of the target, so it makes the gun better. And here's how it works. The furious riot of expanding gas and smoke that causes the shell to hurtle up the barrel is set free just as the back of the shell leaves the end of the barrel but is still within the muzzle brake. Then the gas which is set free, which is shooting forward at tremendous speed, hits the sides of the uh, muzzle brake and pushes against them and is channeled outwards and transfers a huge amount of forwards force on the end of the barrel, counteracting the recoil of the gun. So, whereas if you have no muzzle brake, everything just flies out the front, with this, everything is channeled sideways, the smoke goes sideways, and a lot of the force pushes forwards on the end of the barrel, 
causing lower recoil. Well, it does, the re amount of recoil is the same, but it, it's counteracting that recoil. So that means that the gun doesn't fly backwards so violently, and you can fit a bigger gun into a smaller turret, and you don't get the violent crash um, that uh, all the crew has to feel. And so that's better then. Or is it? Right, well, I'll be talking about whether it's better or not uh, in a moment. But first, I should say something about my kind sponsors. Yes, The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus is a huge website. Uh, you can visit it, and uh, there you can see on it loads and loads of lecture courses. Um, uh, I found a very interesting one, for instance, that's on the paleontology. Now, I have a degree in archaeology, and a lot of people go, oh, wow, archaeology. I find that really interesting. So tell me about the Stegosaurus then. Uh, no. That's paleontology. I did archaeology, which is uh, uh, digging up the remains of the human past. But but anyway, I suppose it's related. And uh, yeah, we all like dinosaurs, don't we? Only this course is a bit more serious. It's not all about you know the famous stuff like the Brontosaurus and the, or, or did the Brontosaurus even exist? Uh, and and the Stegosaurus and the Triceratops and, and the, the the Tyrannosaurus Rex and all those ones. Instead, it's a bit more academic and a bit more interesting, I think, for it in that it looks about how fossils are formed, how they are discovered and how they are interpreted and all that sort of thing. And it goes through all the important ages, geological ages, many of which uh, precede the uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex by quite a lot of millions of years. Anyway, um, uh, I'm going to be looking at that one. But you, of course, can pick from loads and loads of courses. And for one month, you can do so absolutely for free if you uh, type in uh, this address, which is appearing on your screen now, www.thegreatcoursesplus.com stroke Lindy Beige, then that'll take you to an offer. Well, it's actually much easier, by the way, to click on the link, which I'll put in the description. It's a short click, uh, short link, and you just click on it and boom, you're there, much easier. Um, and you will find that you can get one free month looking at any of the courses you care to have a look at. Um, typically, there are about 24 lectures in a course, and each one is about uh, half an hour long. So it's 12 hours per course of, of facts. Um, and uh, if you don't like it, at the end of the month, you can decide it's not for you. All you have to do is, is, is cancel, and then you won't owe, you won't owe a bean. Um, so there you go. Why not go to The Great Courses Plus, give them a look, and, and I, I hope you like it. Anyway, uh, back to muzzle brakes. Now, you may think, oh, well, muzzle brakes are great. They manage the smoke better and they lower the recoil. That's just good, good. So all guns clearly will have muzzle brakes. Well, no, there are several reasons not to have a muzzle brake. Uh, if you look at modern main battle tanks, as they're sometimes called, the Challengers, the Leopards and the Abrahams and so forth, none of them has a muzzle brake. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, they use kinds of ammunition that muzzle brakes interfere with. Now, this is actually is a problem that the British had during World War II with the Firefly. Now, the Firefly was stupendously powerful. Um, I've mentioned this before. It had an excellent 17-pounder gun. Uh, but uh, the British uh, developed something called tis discarding sabo ammunition, which was amazingly powerful and will put a hole right the way through a tiger. But... Um, the way it worked is it had a, an outer jacket and an inner core of, some, of a very, very hard material like tungsten. And uh, because the outer jacket made the whole shell bigger and to fit into the barrel, then you got loads of gas pushing against that large cross-sectional area on the back of the shell, giving a huge push down the barrel. And then when it was set free at the end, the jacket on the outside would break away, lowering the air resistance and the, uh, the, the tiny, thin shell that was in there would be flying at stupendous speed off into and perhaps through its target. Great. Except that the muzzle brake uh, could sometimes interfere. So as the discarding sabot started to break up, immediately left the end of the barrel, it would sometimes collide with bits of the muzzle brake, which might just knock the, the, the inner core slightly, interfering with its accuracy. At short ranges, it wasn't a problem, but at very long ranges, uh, sometimes with the discarding sabot, uh, they had only a 50% chance of hitting, which isn't terribly good by the standards of the day. So um, they would normally expect something like a 98% shot uh, hit chance. So uh, yeah, 50% is really bad. Um, but modern tanks use loads of discarding sabot rounds. They also use folding fin. Uh, so you imagine that you've got fins which uh, fold into the shell as, as it's traveling up the barrel. And then when it's set free at the end, the, the fins chink, fly out and just like a, a playing dart when you're, you're playing darts in the pub, um, guide the shell onto its target. Uh, and again, those 
those fins and the modern discarding sabot, the, 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 the barrel brake gets in the way, muzzle brake gets in the way. Um, so that's one reason you don't want it. Uh, another one is it makes the uh, gun longer and heavier and more expensive and they're all bad. Um, now why would you want a barrel to be even longer? You see, length of barrel is a problem. Uh, let's go back to the Panther. Um, the Panther's barrel, as you can see, sticks out the front of the tank quite a way. And if you turn it sideways, it sticks out an awfully long way. Um, so if you uh, want to camouflage your, your Panther by sticking it in the wood, well, that's great. But then when you try to turn your turret in the wood, you're almost certain to hit a tree. And so you can't actually point the gun the way you want to point it. This was a big problem if you're a Panther. But if you're a Churchill, not a problem because the Churchill uh, barrel didn't actually stick out over the front of the tank. So you could just come into the, uh, into the wood push over a tree and turn your turret wherever you flipping well wanted and, and, and shoot that way. Um, great tanks, Churchills. I think I might make a, a video about just how great they were. Possibly the best tank of the war, and that's not just because they're my favourite. Um, now, uh, another reason you might want not want a barrel to be long um, is that if you're uh, in something like this, which can't even turn its turret at all because it has no turret, um, you need to get to the battlefield. And the battlefield was in 1944, let's say, in, in rural France. And you need to get across a river, which meant that you have to go over the bridge. And the only load-bearing bridge in the area would be not in the middle of the countryside. It would be in a town or in a village. So if you go into a rural, uh, a rural village in 1944 France, um, a, a village that was laid out with roads that were wide enough for a cart, because that's what they were using when they laid the village out. Well, when you get to a corner and you try to turn that corner, you'll, you'll probably find that there's a telegraph pole, a lamppost, or indeed a building that prevents you from turning a corner, because this is a very long vehicle with a very long barrel sticking out the front of it. So you then have to halt and maybe demolish a building before you can get round the corner. Delays, uh, and it's very inconvenient. So anything that makes your barrel even longer is not good. Now you'll notice that this has a very long, it had a very high velocity anti-tank uh, gun on the front of it, and yet it has no barrel brake. The main reason they didn't have a barrel brake on, in fact, the early versions of this did have a barrel brake, um, muzzle brake, um, but they uh, then uh, removed it because this is a very low vehicle. And when its uh, gun is pointing straight forwards, which is not at the moment because I've modeled it uh, with it in transit mode, you can see the little thing, possibly there's a little thing holding uh, the barrel there. It was a part in the kit and I wanted to use it. I was young. Um, but anyway, um, the barrel is only about three feet off the ground, which means that when you fire it, um, it was so close to the ground that it tended to throw up a huge amount of dust, which blinded the crew actually worse uh, than having no barrel brake. So they got rid of the barrel brake on that because the gun was so low. Now, this side blast. This side blast could be really quite substantial. Um, and uh, to give an example, I'm going to read you a bit from a book. Now, just b before I do that, you have to understand something. This is an ordinary Sherman. Now, uh, the narrator of the book that I'm about to read from, uh, Ken Toot, it's called Tank, he was in one of these, and his tank was called Stony Stratford. This is an ordinary Sherman, no barrel break, 75mm gun. But he called for Charlie Tank. Charlie Tank was their code name for the Firefly. The Firefly, enormously powerful gun with a barrel break. So uh, with that in mind, let's uh, see how things went. The invisible 88s are probably SPs firing hull down from behind the Roberts Mesnil Ridge. Only inches of their flat steel turrets need to protrude above the ridge a thousand yards or more away, and behind the hedges their shapes merge so that only the flashes of their guns will betray them. I fire again and again at remembered flashpoints. Other guns alongside and behind me are sending tracer arrows into that same area of confused hedgerows. Keith. Gunner, cease fire. He switches to the A-set. Hello, Roger Three Baker. Can our Charlie move over and lend some weight? Scare the nasties if they're still there. Three Baker, over. Hello, Three Baker. Good idea. Over to, over to you. Uh, hello, Roger Three Charlie. You heard. Take your line from Baker. Three Charlie, over. Charlie, understood. On my way. Off. Keith. Uh, Gunner, use coax and brass up those hedges to give Charlie his target. I fire short bursts into the skyline. A shock blast sends Stony Stratford keeling over to the left. A breath of torrid air. A deafening detonation. Icy fingers of death claw at my veins. I start my escape lit leap. Then I realise that we've not been hit except for the killer blast from our own Charlie's 17 pounder muzzle. He's fetched up too near to us and is almost as much of a danger to us as are the Germans. 
With the sensations of his first shot still rocking and terrorising us, his AP shot smashes into the hedgerow, or something behind it, and opens up a great ragged hole of fire. He goes on firing as quickly as his loader can load, half a dozen shots spaced along this offending skyline. Nothing fires back. Roger, 3 Charlie, cease fire. Resume your normal position, 3 Charlie, over. 3 Charlie, over. Okay, off. So, um, the side blast from a big gun can be horrendous. Now, if, if the muzzle uh, of a gun were here, uh, pointing that way and had a, a muzzle break on it and the gun fired, it would, it would just take my head clean off. It would blow my head clean off my shoulders. I was talking to a Canadian tanker uh, in the modern army and he said that he was on an exercise uh, when a, a largish tank gun that did have a barrel break fired now he wasn't standing right next to the tank he was standing behind the tank and quite some distance away from it but he said that even there um, he felt as though a giant had taken a massive pillow and hit him really really hard backwards uh, the blast from big guns is very substantial and if you've got a, a, a muzzle break then that blast rather than being directed at your enemies is directed sideways where a lot of your friends might be and if you're in the enclosed turret of a, a tank you, you can't be completely certain where all your friends are i remember reading an account on the russian front of a German SP that was just about to be overrun by Russians. They were they were running at it from the front and for some reason they couldn't get a, a machine gun to bear on them. And so they did the only thing which was left open to them. They just fired the main armament. They knew they wouldn't hit anyone. The shell swooshed past all the Russians hitting none of them. But the blast did the job. They were able to get away because in the words of the military report written at the time, uh, the enemy were in no condition to proceed. The blast just knocked them all out. Um, so the side blast from a, a, a substantial a substantial thing like this is a, not something to take lightly. And uh, uh, that's one reason that you don't necessarily put a barrel break on a gun if you can get away with not doing so. Um, so, uh, of course, and the smoke going sideways can, of course, blind all the guys next to you as well. So it, it's a, a bit of a mixed bag, a bit of a mixed blessing, perhaps, the, the smoke going sideways. So barrel breaks... <sighs> muzzle brakes, uh, not necessarily uh, <laughs> muzzle brakes. It sounds like a, um, a, 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 a Jewish congratulation. Oh, muzzle brakes. Anyway, um, uh, they're not necessarily good. And it seems that if people could get away without putting one on, they did. Bye. <laughs>